Okay, now I've made that copy of the base color layer. And I played with warp a little bit just to shift it in little ways. I can also just use my compositing skills and lasso certain areas like this eye. I just don't feel like it's been given enough kind of space. And I can just transform that, right? I can grow it just a little bit. Just adjust it, move it up a tiny bit if it wasn't placed quite right. Or move it in if it's a little bit too far set. I can warp it. This is the advantages of digital art, right? She looks a little menacing with that slope on the inside, so I can just open that up a little. Work on the turn of the eye. And you can see how different that is, right? So making little adjustments can sometimes be very helpful. Now, and you can always continue to paint and refine your base layer, right? I have the um, what do you call it? The kind of gray running behind it now. I can kind of see everything clearly. Some of my values are off, but that's okay as long as I've kind of touched most things. I think I can move ahead to more refined painting now. The other thing I can do is make a copy of my base color layer and I can actually play with the colors under hue saturation. First of all, if I take my saturation all the way down, oh, I'm on the wrong layer. Come on, turn off one. If I take my saturation all the way down under image adjustments, hue saturation, it should look fairly modeled, right? Because no matter how crazy my colors are, I want it to feel like it's dimensional. And I can see that some of the colors are a little darker than they should be when I squint. And I'll adjust that in my refined paint. But I can also play with the hues. If I want to push them all a little bit warmer, I can. Push them all a little bit pinker. Shift them in different ways, I can. This is shifting all the hues a little bit. I think I'm just going to warm all of them up a tiny bit. But I can also individually pick certain hues, like magenta, for instance, and play with its setting, right? Which won't change anything but the uh, the spectrum of the color, but might give me something I'm more interested in reacting to. Or the greens. I don't have a lot of greens in mind, so the little greens there are, I can kind of push into a different zone. Or the reds. So this is a more selective way of using hue saturation, where we can isolate certain color channels. Or the blues. Oh, I kind of like that. And then, of course, on everything, we can say we want it to be more saturated or less saturated, right? See, the yellows can make them a little bit more golden and less toxic green. So, pretty big difference now between this and this. So you choose your, your best variations on your base color. I can turn my sketch off. And now, instead of being based on this kind of source material, I want to think about kind of the level of finish I want. And I was pretty interested in this kind of paint texture and this kind of more simple finish. 
which is a challenge for me because I'm so used to kind of modeling and, and working from life. But I think that's a good challenge. So I'm going to lock my base color layer. I'm going to start a new layer above it, and I'm going to call this refined paint. This is my refined paint layer. And the difference with refined paint is we're going to make our own brush for it, and we're going to use it at a lower opacity. And before I make my own brush, I'm going to customize my background too. Instead of it just being one flat color, I'm going to give it a gradient. And I want it just to be complementary to what I'm painting, right? Like to, to be easy on my eyes as I paint. And so that helps. Kind of layering a warm over a cool as a gradient. So then I'll lock that. And then if there's anything you need to erase in your base color, like this little stray mark, I can do that. This little stray mark, I can do that. And then anything you need to add in your base color, you can always add it on a new layer underneath as well, because often that's what we're missing. So I can paint on a layer underneath my base color layer and kind of fill in some of these little gaps that can happen, especially around the edges. And it won't replace any of the color because it's underneath. And then I just layer them together. Maybe I'll do that one more time with the, the back of the hair. You know, kind of round this out a little bit more, widen it up. And then layer them together. Okay, now, lock my base color. Going to start working on my refined paint. Going to save it. And what I'm going to do is say File New in Photopea. I'm going to show you all how to create your own brush. And I want you all to do it. Because you'll learn more about brush control by creating your own brush than no matter how many custom brushes you might load. So I'm going to create a new project. I'm not even going to give it a special name. I'm just going to make it 1,000 pixels by 1,000 pixels. Not inches, just pixels. A standard brush is 1,000 by 1,000 pixels. On a white background, doesn't matter the DPI because we established the pixels. Then I'm going to click on the default so it's black, solid black on solid white. And then I'm going to use a brush. I might as well stick with the brush I've been using. But... I'm going to scribble just like the hairs of a brush. And I'm going to make kind of an oval that's at a 45 degree angle, kind of floating within this 1,000 by 1,000 pixel square. And I need to make sure, even though my brush has some varied opacity in it, just this noisy marker brush that I've been using, I want to make sure there's some gaps in it. And I want to make sure it also goes to solid black in some places. But this is going to be my blending brush for refined painting. You want kind of open edges, maybe even a few stray marks here and there. Especially if you're doing fur texture, you could really kind of open this up more. I'm doing more skin textures, but a little bit of hair and lace and things like that. So I want edges of this brush shape that are going to blend with pixels around it. When you create a brush, you're basically making a stamp. That if you dipped that brush in ink and then just stamped it really lightly on a piece of paper, this is what it would leave. It's like a fingerprint. There are some people that make brushes based on their inked fingerprint. Because it's not the actual brush that matters much. The shape, it's the settings you put onto it. But this will really help you understand that because we're just making the shape. So I've made this brush. And now I'm going to go to Edit. And I'm going to go to Define New. This is all new stuff. 
So once you've made it black on white, a thousand by thousand pixels, you go to edit, scroll down to define new, and you say brush. And then automatically you have a new brush added to your options. And then I can close it. I don't even need to save it. And now if I look at my brush options, there's a new one right here. And that new one is my brush. But if I just use it as is, it looks really good if I just stamp it once. But if I try to like paint with it, it just looks pretty ordinary. So now I go to brush settings, just like I did with other brushes. And I'm going to start with tip dynamics. And I'm going to play first with the size jitter. And the control is pin pressure. So it's pressure sensitive. So now that's already a little bit more organic looking. But I can do better. So I played with size jitter to about 20. Control with pin pressure. Angle jitter to about 20. This one's really important. Because it will mean it will give a different angle each time. And now that's starting to look a lot more organic at its edges, right? And then roundness jitter and keep the minimal roundness fairly high. That will again vary the edges. And then now I'm going to go to, let's see, transfer, and I'm going to play with what's called the opacity jitter and the flow jitter. And that means that it's going to open itself up to being a little bit less opaque a little bit of the time. And then the last thing I'm going to do is scatter. And I'm going to make it really low because I want to have good control. I'm not trying to turn it into an airbrush. So I'm going to do the position jitter of like such a small percentage, like 2 or 3%. You might not even play with this. And then the count I'm going to keep at 1. And then the count jitter I'm going to keep at, let's say, 4%. Now I'm going to take that brush down in size. And now I've got a nice blending brush that when I use it with color at a lower opacity, I'm going to put it at about 70% opacity, I can keep the flow at 100 This is what I do with the refined paint. I can take a color and paint with it. And notice that it's not going to be 100% opaque right away because I'm only at 70% opacity. And then I blend it with another color next to it. And look, they're already starting to mix with each other. And if I want to blend between them, I just steal the colors that happen from the overlap. And I get all the kind of tones between them. And I throw in other colors. And look at the possibilities of this. It's still not a soft edge brush. It's not the, how I designed it. But it's almost like finger painting or sponge painting. It's going to give me softer edges and a lot more control. Right? Especially if I do smaller sizes at lower opacities. All right, let's try it out. So on my refined brush, or my refined paint layer, with my custom brush, now I'm going to try out this kind of style. Steal a color, start painting with it. But I need to be on the right tool, on the brush tool. That's what I'm doing, but I'm doing it on top of my base painting layer. Mix a few different colors together. I'm still holding down options, stealing colors, but now they're mixing into each other because I'm doing them at lower opacities. And I'm going to start doing it kind of directionally with smaller strokes. Not too zoomed in because I don't want it to take forever. 
but kind of modeling 